Happy Wednesday, everybody. I hope you're having a great day, a great week. It has been a hot one, that's for sure. I think today is going to be the last day of the 100 degree heat, and uh, I'm excited about that. It's just so hot out you can't do anything. So when you find a day like that, what do you do? You stay inside. Uh, nothing funner to do than that than sit in your recliner, watch out the window, and I do a lot of reading, and I've been reading my Bible, uh, which is always a good pastime for me. Finished up Dr. Vine's study Bible this week and started the next one, uh, Warren Wearsby's study Bible. It's Be Transformed and going to be a good read, I can tell. Uh, but finishing Dr. Vine's study Bible up, I was looking through it in some of the places where I've marked some notes and whatnot and came across one section about divine encounters. Divine encounters. The one he singled out was Philip uh, meeting the Ethiopian eunuch. And while, uh, while I was there, he caught up with the, with the Ethiopian eunuch and reading the book of Isaiah, and Philip asked him, what are you reading? He told him, and he said, do you understand? He said, how can I understand unless someone tells me? He invites Philip up into the chariot with him and starts explaining uh, the gospel to him, essentially, and uh, gets to some water, and the eunuch says, what prevents me from being baptized? And uh, after being saved, he's baptized, and Philip is taken away. A divine encounter. Dr. Vine says, I enjoy reading the book of Acts because of all the divine encounters that's there. Because in the book of Acts, we see three different things happen. Three different things happen. We see where the Savior went up, the Spirit came down, and the church went out. If you were to take and sum up the book of Acts, those three statements would sum it up. The, Jesus went up, Savior went up, Spirit came down, and the church went out. Let's talk about that for a, for a few minutes. Uh, we could summarize that book, first of all, by saying the Savior went up. Acts is, is the book that says, basically, the Acts of the Apostles. What happened after, after, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We know the Gospels end with Jesus telling them, go. Go, therefore, teach all nations. Uh, the resurrected happened. Jesus was seen, and he ascended to heaven. Acts records, literally records, that ascension for us. It picks up the very next chapter, if you were, if you wanted to say that, of what happened. Uh, it says that, that, that Jesus, he promises the Holy Spirit to them, Acts 1, 4. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You go on down to verse 9, and we see the ascension. When he had spoken these things... When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud, or taken up in a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they stood and looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. We see where the Savior is received up. Jesus finished what he needed to do. Jesus came to be born, to live his life, to have the three and a half years of ministry, and to die on that cross for our sins. Was put in the grave, rose three days later over a course of 40 days, he was seen by many people, 500 at one time, Paul writes in Corinthians, but was seen by many people, and then he ascended to heaven. He was done. He went to sit down at the right hand of the Father. God's on the throne, and Jesus is sitting right beside him. He did what he needed to do, and now he tells the disciples, wait. We're all good at that, aren't we? What's our next step? Wait. Really? 
Yes, that's what we have to do sometimes, but that's another sermon. Right now, I just want to focus that, that we need to see Jesus ascended to heaven. But with that ascension, he did not leave them just, just powerless, no direction or anything else. He told them, go back to Jerusalem and wait. So we see the first, first thing in the book of Acts is the Savior goes up. But he promises them. Remember in chapter 1, he said, he said, you, you have heard me, or let me back up, verse 4 of chapter 1. They were assembled together. He said, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. John baptized you with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know, in the book of John, Jesus talks extensively about that very thing, about the Holy Spirit coming. He says, I'm going to send you a comforter. We know him as, as, as the word parakletos, that, that comforter that's going to come and, and to be with you, that will give you the power, will give you the direction, will give you the reassurance that you need. And when you read the book of Acts, wow, do we see that power. Because the disciples do go back to Jerusalem. After Jesus ascends to heaven, they go back to Jerusalem. They're in the upper room. They're, they're meeting, and they choose Matthias to be uh, the one that replaces Judas and, and it had to be someone that was there from the baptism of Jesus that saw uh, the death, burial, and resurrection, had to witness it. And, and they called Matthias. And then in chapter 2 it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, 50 days, 50 days after the resurrection there, now we see Pentecost. 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven, we see it finally happen. They were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, one set upon each one of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we see the Spirit comes next. The Savior went up, and now the Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit descends down as promised. The Holy Spirit has been around. It's been around in the Old Testament. It's, he's, he, the Holy Spirit is not shown or exemplified as it is today, as it was in the New Testament. But the Holy Spirit was still at work. Make no mistake. The Holy Spirit came to bring them the power. That was the reassurance that they needed. That was the fulfillment of what Christ said needed to happen. Came down in the mighty rushing wind, the divided tongues of fire, one sat upon each of them and gave them utterance, another, another language. And please understand this. Uh, this, this. This speaking in tongues was for a purpose. To, to show the fulfillment of what Christ had said, but to the people that were there. On this day of Pentecost, it was one of the Jewish feast days, and, and literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of people would fill Jerusalem, much as they did the day uh, Passover feast, would come for that and were there. And this gave the opportunity to the disciples where they could share the gospel in the language, the native language of those people that are there. What people were there? Verse 7, then they were all amazed, marveling, saying to one another, look, are not all these men who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Aegis, Phrygia, Asia, Phrygia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. So they were amazed and perplexed to one another. Whatever could this mean? As we see the, the, the speaking in tongues in this situation, and, and we see it even in other situations, the fulfillment of showing salvation uh, with that starting of the New Testament church, that that, that was, was one of the signs. We are baptized by the Holy Spirit when we are saved. Not all of us speak in tongues. Do I believe in speaking in tongues? That is a relevant issue. 
Uh, that is a biblical doctrine that is there. The practice of it is another thing. That's another sermon for another time. What I want to focus on, though, is, is with the book of Acts, we see the second thing that happens. Savior goes up, the Spirit comes down. And with that Spirit coming down, it allowed the, the apostles to share Jesus in in many other languages and it's a theme that's carried out with with Paul and some of the other apostles in other places as a confirmant a sign that they are saved uh, particularly with the Gentiles when Peter goes to Cornelius we see that the Holy Spirit falls upon them when they are saved Peter gets called kind of to account on it when he gets back to Jerusalem he took other men with him and, and at the Jerusalem council even in Acts 50 15 after Paul and Silas's first missionary journey we see where there are the ones that are saying no you have to be circumcised to become a Christian and 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 Paul is saying no that that has passed that is not the way it is and what the council is they're meeting together and I imagine some tempers tempers were getting flaring up a little bit we see where Peter speaks up and says, Men, remember when I went to Cornelius? Remember the Holy Spirit fell upon them? Paul has just said that as he went out, the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they spoke in tongues. They were spirit-filled, showing that the Gentiles, that's you and me basically, have the right to salvation and can be saved also. And the Jerusalem Council came up and said, you know, you're right, we're not going to put this burden upon them and wrote out what it is that they needed to do for Christianity and, and, and you know, don't eat meat strangled with blood, stay away from sexual, uh, uh, stay away from immorality uh, fornication, uh, those kind of things, and wrote it in a letter and sent it out. My point, I'm kind of getting off track here, my point is the Savior went up, the Spirit came down. The Holy Spirit came down, and every believer, every believer, the Holy Spirit fills them. As I, as I preach this message to you via video, I can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit coming on me because I've got things that aren't even on my notes. Maybe I ought to stick to my notes and it'd make for a shorter sermon. But all of us have the Holy Spirit. The, the Savior went up, the Spirit went down, and that allowed a third thing to happen. The church went out. The church went out. When the church went out originally, we see it was in the Jerusalem area. We see Philip in, in Acts chapter 8 was told to go to the desert to see the Ethiopian eunuch that was there. We see in Jerusalem immediately the church going out. Peter and John going along and the lame man uh, on the road that was begging uh, for alms. Peter looks at him and says, gold and silver have I none. But what I want to give you is the gift of God. I paraphrased on that one. We see the divine encounters start happening because Jesus went up and the, and the Spirit came down. And the church started going out. The church, Philip went to Samaria. Peter went to see Cornelius. And, and in Acts chapter 8, we see that church also goes out in another way. What, what is that other way? Now, when Saul was consenting, eight, chapter 8, verse 1 of Acts, now Saul was consenting to his death, speaking of Stephen. At that time, great persecution arose against the church at Jerusalem, and they were scattered all through the regions of Judea and Samaria. The apostle Paul, who was then Saul of Tarsus, was persecuting the church. He was arresting the Christians. He was determined to get rid of this thing called the way. Peter went to Cornelius. That's way outside the jurisdiction of of Jerusalem, but Saul, he's on his way to Damascus, again outside of Jerusalem. When Peter writes his epistle, it's to, to the persecuted Christians that are not in Jerusalem. And the Apostle Paul, after his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, he goes to Damascus, he waits, and Ananias comes, sight is restored, and Paul is given uh, or Saul of Tarsus is given his orders, his command, you're going to go to the Gentiles. You're going to go and you're going to preach. And Paul immediately starts preaching. 
and he's not well received. Then he, he's let down over the wall at night because there's a plot to kill him. He goes to Jerusalem from there, and they kind of stay away from him there because they're afraid of him. He goes to the desert and hides out there and examines and looks and, and explores and, 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 and really starts putting life together of what happened. And in and, and Antioch of Syria, we see where revival breaks out. The apostles want to know if this is real, what's going on. They send Barnabas up. Barnabas goes there, and he starts teaching. He sees this is real and genuine, and the first thing Barnabas does is he goes and gets Saul from Tarsus and brings him. And Saul and Barnabas disciple those new Christians there for a couple of years. And then after that, God tells them to send Paul and Barnabas on a mission trip. Still Saul, or no longer Saul, but now Paul, and it's Barnabas and Paul, but after they leave, after they get off the island of Crete, we see where it turns the other way, and then it becomes Paul and Barnabas, no longer Barnabas and Paul. And where is it that Paul goes? Paul goes to Lystra, Derby. He goes to Iconia. He goes back. He goes on a second missionary journey, and he goes to, to, to Philippi, to Apollonia, to Thessalonica, to Berea, to Athens, to Corinth, to Ephesus, those areas that are there. He goes and he evangelizes there. That's way outside of the limit. And while he's there in Corinth, who does he meet? Aquila and Priscilla. Why are they there? Because of the persecution of Rome and sends him out. The church goes out. So we see with this in the book of Acts, all through the book of Acts, this is the thing. The first chapter, Jesus goes up. In the second chapter, the Spirit comes down. And the rest of the book of Acts is the church going out. That didn't happen just in Acts. It wasn't just a one and done deal. I want you to understand it goes so much more than that because the book of Acts is still happening today. Jesus is still in heaven. We're waiting on his return. I still remember the, 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 the writing of what those angels said. Men, why are you looking up this same Jesus? He's coming back in like manner. He's coming back. So that tells me the Spirit has come down, and we are the church today. We need to be going out. He tells us in Acts 1, 8, go, go, make disciples in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm not a big ge uh, geography person, geographically oriented, but I know that between me and between Jerusalem, there's a whole lot of, of, of real estate and a great big ocean. You know what that tells me? I'm the uttermost parts, and I need to be telling people. We are the book of Acts today. We are the living Bible that people will read and see with our lives. We need to be telling people. The book of Acts, we are not only reading it, we're living it, and we need to be sharing with others. We need to be the church that is going out. We need to go out into our neighborhood. We need to go out into our community. We need to go out into our county. We need to go out into our state. We need to go out into our nation and to the world. We need to do everything we can to tell as many people as we can while we still can. Join with me in prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you even for this warm weather. I pray that we may take these words from the book of Acts and that we may be encouraged by them. We may look for divine encounters and we may have those divine experiences. Fill us with your spirit, God, each and every day and let us go where you send us. Say what you need us to say to the people we need to say it to. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Real quick update on where we're at with our schedule. Uh, Sunday, the 29th, we will be on the COVID schedule still. We'll meet Sunday morning for as many want to come in they can. If uh, you want to stay out in the parking lot, you can do that. That's your choice or watch the video at home. Uh, and then... Labor Day weekend, September 5th. We will be back inside 
Uh, doors are open, as they're open now, but it will be a regular Sunday schedule for our worship services. We will be meeting live, in person, Sunday morning and Sunday night. No Sunday school. Uh, and then the 5th, uh, or, or that Wednesday, we still won't meet. But the next week, September 12th, everything will be back to normal. <laughs> We hope and we pray. We don't know that for sure. But that is our goal, to be back inside and to be meeting uh, on our Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, children's programs, everything picking back up on the 12th of September. Thank you guys for being patient as we have gone through this time. I think we're on the back side of it for our little community. But please know in the state, it's not over by far. There's many, many, many things that are that are going on. I heard last night uh, Wilberton schools have gone all digital. Uh, Tuesday, they had 40 cases recorded of COVID just in the student body, just in the schools. So we're, we're still there, but be praying and look forward to seeing you Sunday. God bless you guys. <laughs>